When I was a teenager, I was really into Doctor Who. No, wait, where are you going? The reason I mention this is to let you know a bit about the type of person I am. I was always more into sci-fi than I was fantasy, and I usually wound up super obsessed with something when I got into it. Uh, case in point. So when I got into Doctor Who, I made an effort to learn everything there was to know about the franchise, regardless of how strongly that something actually fit into canon. This held true for other franchises as well. You see, I dropped Doctor Who at some point, growing tired with the formula and clearly moved on to more Batman-centric pastures, but there's another franchise that's more... well, complicated for me. Really, really complicated. I'll circle back to why I bring this up later, but with the new Amazon series having just been released, I wanted to share my unique experience with the franchise while also taking a deep dive into the new show. Had to make a video on something up to date eventually, right? Straight off the bat, I'm conflicted on how to approach this show. On the one hand, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of someone totally unfamiliar with the Fallout franchise, wondering how much of the content works without any foreknowledge. On the other hand, I'm a viewer with a collective 995 hours between Fallout 3, 4, and New Vegas. It's kinda hard to set all that aside and be purely objective, but I'm still gonna try, even if my brain gets all tingly from recognizing game objects in the background. So. The startup is good. We're introduced to the world and the people. It's a feet first approach and I think it works pretty well. Oh hey, it's Walton Goggins, Cecil from Invincible. Who's he playing this? Oh, oh no. But let's dissect the opening scene a little. I feel like I could dedicate a whole video just to this part of the episode, but I'll try and just summarize. The dialogue is reasonably expository, but it's never in a way that feels wooden or disingenuous. We get a bit on the news where the weatherman starts to lose it, which demonstrates how high tensions must be getting with the threat of war looming overhead. Can't, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I can't do the weather if I don't even know if there's going to be a next week. Happy thoughts I'm not, today. Dude, and it's interesting to see people witnessing things like that and just pushing it to the back of their minds, acting like everything's fine, when clearly society is on the brink of collapsing in on itself like a dying star. It's a stark contrast, seeing the veneer of an idyllic, almost utopian society that exists before the nuclear catastrophe and the grim reality that follows. This juxtaposition is not only visually striking, but also philosophically rich highlighting humanity's penchant for self-destruction despite whatever technological advancements we make to better ourselves. Then we get the bomb. Time kind of slows down, almost showing a flash freeze of the last moments of humanity as we know it. Goggins tosses his daughter on his horse, riding like hell and cut. I'm so freaking on board, you have no idea. So, after the world falls apart, we're introduced to one of three main characters, Lucy. She's a vault dweller, and the most cookie cutter, good girl vault dweller you can be. We get this plot element that her vault, Vault 33, has an annual exchanging of citizens with Vault 32 in order to ensure genetic variability. And you know what? As a guy who took two attempts to pass biology class, this makes sense to me. But uh oh, the guys from Vault 32 who look a little more rugged than you'd expect. Yeah, they try to treat it like a lightly foreshadowed twist that these guys are raiders, but it's honestly so heavy handed. It's like all their stats are in strength. There are little details they don't throw in your face, like the one who pairs off with Lucy drinking from a vase is subtle, but then there are times we get extreme close ups on their tattoos and stuff. It's just a bit too obvious. Raiders. So, 
crap hits the fan. There's a massacre, and the raiders nab Lucy's daddy, Mr. Twin Peaks as I call him. Every day, once a day, give yourself a present. Don't plan it, don't wait for it, just let it happen. In a way that feels like a more emotionally resonant version of the dad vanishing in Fallout 3, or Mr. Pee Pants as I like to call him. Vault 33's introductory scenes are pretty well structured, giving us lore, character motivations, as well as setting up an overall tone, and providing some patented Fallout humor that manages to fit without being distracting, a la any quip from a superhero movie in the past dozen years. Get that jelly mold out of here! Then we move along to a new segment focusing on our third and final main character, Maximus. Maximus is a member of the Brotherhood of Steel, a group that can vary greatly between Fallout games in both morality and quality. My first concern was that they'd be the morally righteous good guys, like in Fallout 3, but they thankfully avoid going down that route, instead opting for something that operates in more of a gray area. Their boot camp is somewhere philosophically between a military training facility and Catholic school. I mean, it makes sense. In the games, they've always gone with religious titles like Paladin and Elder. After Maximus's friend gets hurt in a trap, laid out by another member seemingly, Maximus is brought in for questioning under the suspicion that he may have caused the injury. This is when we get Titus. Speak. Yeah, that's the moment I realized they weren't going to be the good guys. But he sounds like Frank Horrigan. If he whips off that helmet and he's a mutant, I don't think I'll even blink. The segment is nuanced and overall gives the impression that the writers are really trying with the show. We get a final segment, shorter, which reintroduces Walton Goggins' character, now known only as the Ghoul. It's quick, but does a good job of A, showing how antsy people get around ghouls, and B, illustrating that he's going to be a major player for the season, on par with Lucy and Maximus. And finally, C, it shows that he isn't one to mess around. After 200 years, he's more than a little jaded. The episode, The End, is not just about the literal end of the world, but also about the end of an era the end of innocence, and perhaps the beginning of a new kind of human saga. It sets up a series that promises to be both a reflection on past mistakes and a speculative exploration of future possibilities, however bleak, all while maintaining a sharp, sardonic edge that keeps the viewers engaged and, importantly, entertained. So far, a very very strong start. I wasn't expecting much, for reasons that'll become more clear as we go, but I'm pleasantly surprised by what I've seen. I don't want to set the world on fire. My parents were, in most ways, pretty lenient with what I watched growing up. I think I saw Robocop when I was about seven, Terminator even younger and their personal policy held true with video games. Until it didn't. You see, my pops let me play with his copy of Vice City. He played it himself first, so he a thousand percent knew what I was getting into. He only changed his tune when he saw that I, as a six-year-old, kept getting a flamethrower and lighting the nearest cop up like he was kindling. It's irrelevant to add that my dad was in law enforcement, so that probably struck a sour note for him. So. No more M-rated games. Ever. Never. Ever. Oh, hey, this game looks fun. Fallout 3 was a breath of fresh air to preteen me, since for the prior six years I'd been locked into GameCube games like Luigi's Mansion and Battle for Bikini Bottom. I was still definitely too young to play it, but what was I going to do? Argue that I shouldn't? I wasn't exactly popular as a kid in school go figure, but everybody was playing Fallout 3. It was a grand equalizer. I remember chatting with schoolmates about how totally messed up Andale was specifically, which, if you're unfamiliar, is a town full of cannibals who maintain a white picket fence aesthetic at the same time. Then 
this one kid wanders up, my school bully, and he starts gaslighting us, saying that he had a random encounter with Bigfoot in the game, how he was really hard to beat, and when he won, he leveled up, like, twice, three times, even. I remember dedicating hours to the game, specifically hoping to find Bigfoot, of all things, like I'm part of some trash reality show. Ultimately, I dedicated hundreds of hours to the game. There is nothing else like it to me. While my opinion has changed a bit with time, and I can definitely see the flaws with it now, I still look back on those early days with the game fondly. Warts and all. Never did find Bigfoot though. Girls! Girls! Watch out! Watch out! There's a two Episode 2 dives deeper into the post-apocalyptic universe, where the blend of desolation and human endeavor paints a vivid picture of survival and moral quandary. It starts us off with Wilzig, an enclave scientist who we know went AWOL from the last episode. It's a flashback that gives us the story as to why, and it works pretty cleanly. Also, the Fallout games always saddle the protagonist with a canine compatriot, usually named Dogmeat, so that's what I'm going to call this guy too. It's a bit sad as well. I feel like circling back to that thought of, is the show good for a newcomer? It drops the ball a little bit with the Enclave, because they don't really explain who they are. Seeing Wilzig bond with an animal works because it's clearly not allowed, but I feel like you get a lot less mileage out of that without having brushed up on the wiki at minimum. Maybe they plan to save the Enclave as a faction for later down the line, but it could have benefited the scene a lot more than what we got. Not far from this scene, we cut to Maximus and Titus, more or less where we left them off in the last episode. Maximus is clearly trying to learn and grow and maybe bond with Titus, but our resident man of iron obviously wants him to do one thing and one thing only, be a silent servant. Which is why it's super satisfying watching Titus get absolutely decked by a Yao Guai. Rip Bozo, we hardly knew you. Thank God. Seeing him put on this brave face, acting as the Brotherhood's ideal soldier, and then running at the first sign of trouble? Positively magnificent. As for that slick Brotherhood armor that he was rocking, our boy Maximus loots that thing as soon as Titus's HP hits zero. We get a sequence of him messing around with it, and it's all pretty cathartic. So as for Lucy, she makes it to the first settlement we're seeing on screen, Philly. It's here that I think it's time to talk about my biggest gripe with the show so far. It's way too clean. Like. In Fallout 3, people complained that everything was washed out, green and bland, so when we get to 4, there was a new degree of vibrancy, and everyone said it looked great, which, for the most part, I agree, but it feels like they've continued in that direction, to the point that, aside from the sets themselves, everything feels almost sanitized. Like, these people are wearing clothes made from literal junk, but you get the impression that that junk just went through the wash. It's just a bit too clean. You know what? If my biggest complaint is costume design, I think they must be doing pretty damn good work overall. Anyway, the ghoul is here, and boy does he love shooting. Well, he's here for Wilzig, and I've got to say I love this shootout segment. It's rough, grungy, and violent in just the right way. Visceral without feeling forced. Plus, a lot of the slow-mo shots give me vibes of vats from the games, which gives my brain the good chemicals. The last bit of the fight is mostly the ghoul v Maximus, dawn of tiny punches, which sucked a bit of the air out of it. I also don't love that the Brotherhood armor flies like Iron Man with the repulsor wrists. I much prefer the jetpack design, which fits the retrofuturism thing a bit better, more akin to the Rocketeer. Oh, also, another complaint. The ghoul stabs dog meat straight in the ribs. That sucks, but that's not the problem. The problem comes after the fight. He sticks the boy with a stim pack, and suddenly dog meat is right as rain. Listen, I get how stim packs work in the games, 
It's a healing item in an RPG for God's sake, but TV works differently. The suspension of disbelief is a bit more tenuous, and this bit bugged me. Also, Lucy used a stim pack back in episode one, but it gave the impression that it was, like the name might imply, a stimulant, because she still had to circle back later and stitch that thing up. Here, syringe, boom, healed. Lucy gets out of there with Wilzig. Wilzig dies, but not before telling Lucy to pack his head along for her journey to deliver it to the same woman who kidnapped her dad. Okie dokie. I don't it's a little sad and a little funny, exactly like Fallout should be. So far, I'm noticing really sharp dialogue as we go, and the dark humor that punctuates the bleakness of the wasteland offers a very satirical take on the idea of civilization rebuilt from the ashes. The episode also subtly critiques society's reliance on technology and organized control through its portrayal of the remnants of pre-war governments and emerging factions, which becomes more solidified as we work our way through the season. So, episode two down, general thoughts? I'm still enjoying it. I feel like the first episode had a bit more going on, and I'm seeing some flaws more in this episode than the first, but I'm hoping it's just a dip in quality that's ultimately going to be pretty negligible by the time I get to the end of things. All in all, the target is a compelling fusion of action and introspection, with each character's journey offering a piece of the broader existential puzzle. Fallout's strength has always lied in its ability to weave individual survival stories into the tapestry of larger sociopolitical commentary, making every move part of a survivalist chess game on a board built off of moral ambiguity. I remember in high school, I got so excited when I heard that Fallout New Vegas was in production. Every day before class, I would hunker down in the library at one of the computers and just dig into the latest posts on the Fallout forums, specifically those on No Mutants Allowed. Day after day, I would watch and re-watch trailers, production videos, theories, the whole thing. I wanted more. I was a teen with time to burn, and this was the way I chose to burn it. Then, the game came out. It was amazing. If Fallout 3 was exciting, I don't even have the words to describe how much I loved New Vegas. I invented my own character, gave them a full backstory and personality, and set them into the Nevada. I played it start to finish. Then, start to finish. And then, I needed more. I loved the game, really loved it, and it easily became my favorite growing up. But then it was done, and all I could do was wait for whatever came next. Maybe you'll think so, episode three kicks off pretty well. Not to get ahead of myself, pun fully intended, but I like this one a lot more than the last. But they play that same theme every time the ghoul is on screen, and it's already wearing super thin with me. Dude could sneeze and the soundtrack would add his theme to make it more dramatic. <laughs> but I'm very happy to say that this is my only major issue with the episode. I was starting to get a bit worried that I might be overly cynical about the whole thing after the last episode, but this is a pretty respectable improvement. We see Lucy being proactive in the wasteland, putting a tracker in Wilzig's head in case she loses it, which she does. We see Maximus give some poor scav the Red Rush treatment, and I'm starting to really get behind these sweeping establishing shots. They kind of remind me of Lord of the Rings in the way they give a sense of grandeur and scope. Also, we get to see more of Norm. Evening, everybody. Oh, Norm! Norman? I love him. Most of my notes on this one are about Maximus, which I'm glad for because I feel like he was a bit too flat in the first two episodes. 
so seeing some flesh get added to him is objectively a good thing. Since Titus got turned into compost, Maximus has started to masquerade as him. The Brotherhood of Steel sends a new squire, one of the guys who used to pick on him back in boot camp, and it leads into some pretty interesting character development. You see, Maximus is a massive jerk to his squire, and I'm left to wonder how much of it is motivated by revenge versus pretending to be Titus versus going on a power trip. It's probably a healthy blend of all three, but slowly and surely, a camaraderie starts to form between the two of them. There's obviously a power imbalance, but they eventually start to get along a little better while searching for Wilzig's head. It feels earned, but still carries the implication that, well, he's Maximus, not Titus. Then we get the Gulper. I enjoy seeing a big old beastie play a part in the story, and I genuinely appreciate how they cause continual trouble for all three protagonists until, finally, Maximus takes him out while saving his squire. It's also a good scene for Maximus since he told his squire to get to safety when Titus would easily have tossed Maximus at the Yao Guai if he was within range. Side note, I was really sure the squire was going to come out as just his torso, a la that one poor schmuck in Resident Evil 2. They kill it, and they find Wilzig's head. <laughs> Overall, it's an improvement, I'm happy to say. Things feel like they're starting to pick up steam plot-wise. And I'm back in it. Crawl out through the fallout, baby, to my loving arms, through the rain. Five years is a lot of time when you're growing up. I still held the franchise close to my heart during that time between New Vegas and 4. I even wrote a fan fiction, which I will not be sharing. It's locked behind closed doors, along with my Doctor Who fanfics starring my own OC Time Lord. But I started getting antsy about it. I would check news articles for something, anything, about the long-rumored Fallout 4. Eventually, I started watching fan projects on YouTube like Nuka Break and, notably, The Storyteller. It was revelatory. I pored over those videos and it felt like they were made exactly for people like me. Dozens upon dozens of videos detailing the lore of the Fallout universe. It was great and gave me a way to experience the original games when, frankly, I've got ADHD brain so bad that I just can't manage old school titles like Fallouts 1 and 2. That obsessive interest in learning everything, that trait I still clearly carry today, was suddenly being sated by a group of peeps who seemingly felt the same way. It was great, and I knew there would be more to come from them, eventually. Let's go sunning, it's so good for you. Let's go sunning, need the sky of blue. Green Picking up sun. episode four, Lucy is still in tow with the ghoul, and we get a moment that, as far as I'm aware, has always been talked about in the Fallout games, but never actually shown to us. A ghoul mid-change. The ghoul bumps into an old buddy of his, hoping to find more of that sweet pea-toned mystery drug that keeps his brain in one piece. Seeing that his friend is on the brink of losing it, he gives him a nice little of mice and men moment before doing what needs doing. Ah damn! Apple pie! <laughs> you know, my mom used to- I want to say that every inch of this scene feels natural, dour, and earned. It's honestly a highlight in my mind of the show overall. This episode doesn't flit around as much as the others, focusing exclusively on Lucy and Vault 33. In Vault 33, we learn that Norm Evening everybody. No. Norman? has survivor's guilt, and he's not the only one suffering. Pregnant trauma sex is both something I never thought I would say out loud, nor did I ever think I'd see it on screen. Well, 
C'est la vie. Norm grabs his cousin and they excavate Vault 32, where we get an all-time classic with the Fallout franchise, something I'm so happy to watch unfold. A big ol' vault mystery. Everyone's dead. I mean, we knew that, but everyone's been dead for a while. I'm in it. I'm loving it. Even if you didn't play the games, I think the mystery functions really well on its own here, and it's pretty damn engaging. On Lucy's side of things, she gets traded off, and we meet a Mr. Handy Robot, voiced by Matt Berry. What? No! What a disgusting idea! <laughs> I'm simply going to harvest your organs. Because huh? he's my best friend, he's my pal. He's my homeboy, my rotten soldier. He's my sweet cheese, my good time boy. She's about to be cut up and sold for parts, but busts out of there. She gets a genuine vault hero moment, saving people while simultaneously doing the darkest thing she's ever done, taking someone's life. At least it was an absolute necessity in the moment. So an easier pill to swallow in that way. I like it too. It makes it feel like when the moment inevitably arrives that she has to kill someone due to a moral issue instead of immediate survival, it won't be completely out of left field. It's played with gravity, and you can see that the descent might just happen for her sometime soon. While not a lot necessarily happened in this episode, I think that's a good thing. They're letting scenes breathe and they aren't rushing through anything. Oh shit, is this actually a great show? He's a demon. He's a devil. <gasps> He's a dog. June 2015, E3. One of the most exciting days for me when it comes to gaming. I've officially fallen out of love with Doctor Who, and I'm ready to get back on the post-apocalyptic monorail, baby. I'm back in it. I'm on the Reddit threads. I'm scrolling through forums. I'm living in Todd Howard's walls. Every bit of info is a morsel I must consume. I've gone full fanboy. Why is it called the Commonwealth? Who's this guy? Does he have a metal hand? I dive back into those fan projects, replay the games, and... I don't finish playing either of them. Uh-oh. Maybe it was just that other games enticed me more. Or maybe I grew into one of those people who are just too critical about the things they loved, but it just didn't resonate with me this time. I guessed I'd probably come back around when Fallout 4 released. I mean, I pre-ordered it already, so, you know, worth a shot. <laughs> Episode 5 is just... okay. We see Maximus having an identity crisis about pretending to be Titus, but that doesn't get the play it should. He kinda tells his squire, and then he's left alone. It could have been given a bit more time. It's like a minute max, and there's so much potential the scene could have had that just gets glossed over. Mysteries abound with this one. We learned that somebody dropped a whole ass nuke on Shady Sands, a location of grand importance to, well, every game except for Fallout 4, and Lucy drops a hint that she grew up outside of the vaults. As for the Vault 32 mystery, that I'm continuing to enjoy. Seeing it evolve to include the adjacent Vault 31 is absolutely great, and immediately twists the perception of the other vault dwellers. It becomes this winding conspiracy of trust and mistrust that I can't wait to see more of. So let's do that now. <laughs> Never mind, we aren't getting to that just yet, apparently. But a lot of episode 6 had the fanboy in me just buzzing. The Galaxy News intro at the beginning, a man and his dog. I understood that reference. And the goddamn New Vegas theme. Okay, let's take a step back. Be objective, you know? Well, what's to say? 
I still love the episode on its own. It's interesting to see as much of pre-war America as we get, especially considering how sparse it's been both in the show and in the games. I picked up on Matt Barry voicing a Mr. Handy in the earlier episode, but having him show up in person was a treat. You Some... gave it to me as a gift. You took it by force from me in New York City. Yes, and it looked better on me in New York City. Knowing that he's a fellow actor who sold his voice likeness really adds, especially knowing the ghoul is kicking around and just occasionally hearing the voice of his dead friend. Vault 4's character stuff is pretty well done too. We get some grade A flirtation between Lucy and Maximus. You wanna have sex? We're bang, okay? And Chris Parnell absolutely devours the scenery whenever he's on screen. I also feel like they did a good job of building up the tension because it's initially hard to determine how much of your apprehension about the vault is warranted and how much is a projection of Maximus and Lucy. But then when it goes down, it goes down hard. Plus, they've circled back around to our antagonist from episode one and building her up as this seemingly ageless woman they call Flame Mother. Oh man, it's perfect. The mysteries just keep adding up, but it all feels like it's leading somewhere conclusive. Meaning, I'm mad invested, man. Fallout 4 hit store shelves, and that was in line for the midnight release. The last midnight release I've ever gone to. I graduated high school in the time it took for this game to come out, and holding the disc in my hand, that was the moment I decided to become a college dropout. I spent so much time dedicated to this game, it's astounding. I loved every second. It improved on Fallout 3's design in a bunch of ways. Sure, most are cosmetic or quality of life improvements, but there's nothing wrong with that. They announced that there will be DLC, so I shelled out for the season pass. I kept playing the game, avoiding spoilers because I wanted to get to the ending on my own time. I just keep going. I try not to look too hard. I I was living in a dream world. The game was good, but not great. Not what I had hoped for. But still, I was in denial, in a honeymoon phase with the latest release of my favorite game franchise. It's during this phase that I even reached out to one of my favorite YouTube channels dedicated primarily to Fallout content, ShoddyCast. I was still enamored, obsessed with Fallout 4, convincing myself that it belonged in the video game Hall of Fame. I get so on board with the idea that, well, that's my name on the opening credits. I chat with the creators behind ShoddyCast about plenty of stuff. I was still a teenager, so I'm mostly going on about how they should try and get Markiplier to cameo while they're nodding, saying, uh-huh, sure, buddy, and actually doing their jobs. But it was fun. It felt special to be a part of something like that. The fact that I can talk to coworkers or new friends, have them say they like Fallout, and then awkwardly segue into showing them this five-second clip where my name's on screen, Chef's kiss, immaculate. I don't like to think that I have an ego, but 1.1 million views. I think I'm allowed to gloat a smidge. I didn't hang around for too long, about six months, which ironically is like getting a refund on the Titanic before the ship leaves port, but I definitely remember it fondly. And it was one of my first steps into trying out the whole YouTuber thing. Why did I leave? Well, I finished Fallout 4. The ending was abrupt. The first time I played, I sided with the Institute, specifically because I was enticed by the promise that I, the player, would become the new head of the organization. I imagined what it would be like from a role-playing perspective to take over and start compromising with the Commonwealth. But after the final battle, it just ends. There's almost no fanfare. There's very little you could even consider to be the ending. 
and I suddenly felt hollow. I realized the full scope of the product on my hands and it was bad. You load 16 tons and what do you get? You get another day older and so, deeper in debt. When we left off, things went south in Vault 4 and Lucy got nabbed by the Vault Dwellers. Starting off episode seven, she's in an interrogation room and they decide to show her a tape of what went wrong in Vault 4 before just sentencing her right away. Breaking it down like that, the scene feels really clunky. Like they wanted to fit in exposition, but didn't exactly know how. They don't ask her any questions. They don't make an argument. They just share the exposition and then haul her away. So she and Maximus get the boot and Maximus finally decides to have a there's something I need to tell you moment. I'll be honest, having watched as much television as I have, I was immediately wondering what random thing was going to happen to stop him from coming clean to Lucy, but I was delighted when there wasn't anything. Dude just shares his skeleton in the closet and there's no interruption. Hell, even more impressive from a writing standpoint is Lucy just kind of going, yeah, okay, that's reasonable considering your circumstances. Holy crap, forget my earlier complaint about Vault 4, this easily makes up for it. Also, Fred Armisen is here. You undercook fish, believe it or not, jail. You overcook chicken, also jail. Undercook, overcook. These comedian cameos somehow manage to be really entertaining without breaking the immersion. It's a perfect balancing act. This episode, reasonably, feels like the build up to the next. Setting up the dominoes for... The final episode, the season one finale, Lucy finally manages to deliver Wilzig's head and we get a big final flashback. It's finally said directly after decades of fan speculation that vault Tech did in fact drop the first bomb that led to the end of the world. The meeting itself is really dark and really dramatic in a way I enjoyed greatly. The only part that wasn't great was the CGI Mr. Twin Peaks. But hey, we've been complaining about digitally de-aged actors for a while now. I think we all understand that the technology still just isn't quite where we want it to be. So, we get the gradual moral descent of Hank McLean, Lucy's father, and she gets dragged down a little too. This scene deserves a bit of special attention because of how slow it is. And I mean that as a compliment. They don't rush anything, the actors get to chew the scenery, backed up by the soundtrack, and it's perfect. Of course, being the final episode, I'd been sitting here expecting a big ol' final fight, and we do get that. But the thing that makes this so good is the context we've been given over the preceding seven episodes. If you just watched the action scene in a vacuum, it would be just a solid action sequence with a few standout elements, but knowing the characters, their morals, their conflicts, it makes the whole thing utterly depressing in a masterfully charged way. At the end of it, after after Hank, at the end of it, after Hank flies off, you're left hanging with a twisted stomach, seeing our characters change even further now that we've reached this moral fork in the road. By extension, seeing those lights, the wasteland being given life, it's hard to describe the emotion behind such a simple set piece. The world has been dry and dead, but now there's a literal light in the darkness, and the smallest chance of hope and of change for the better. But that flame needs to be nurtured, and the flame mother is dead. It's all over but the cross. I got a good gaming laptop, the ultimate misnomer, to play Fallout 4 on PC. I had this inkling of a feeling that I might enjoy the game better with mods, which, yeah, I did. But it became such a headache to manage. What mods are better? What mods don't work well with others? Where did all my textures go? Why is every mod so horny? 
Eventually, after years of playing Fallout 4 on and off with the advent of mods built by the community, I just felt like it wasn't worth the effort, let alone the amount of time it takes to set up. Then, Bethesda had their fiasco. You know the one. Burlap sacks, moldy helmets, microtransactions. Out of spite, I tossed out my merch and wiped my hands clean of it. I wasn't gonna touch Fallout 76 with a 76 foot long pole. Thankfully, I'm not setting this up for a bit where I go, oh, but then I did buy it. No, if you did buy it, you're a fool. I don't care if you did buy it on sale for $5, Allison. Ugh, <sighs> sorry. It's a touchy subject. Gaming as a whole, when it comes to the industry, gets my blood boiling. Bethesda and Konami always find a way to both attract my attention as well as my fury. But I saw this as a point of no return for Bethesda. Clearly, they'd lost the plot. What little they had. When Starfield started getting trailers, I couldn't have cared less. The people who say it's good? Seems to me like they're all standing exactly where I was back in 2016. Bethesda, as a game studio, has lost me. As a TV studio, however. Hey. All out the show, on the whole, it's spectacular. And there are plenty of scenes I either keep thinking about or have been quoting back and forth with my friends. Do you want to make my cock explode now? There are a couple gripes here and there, like the fact they bring up the water chip being broken in Vault 33 only to never mention it again, but it's a solid 9 out of 10 for me. Scenes are never rushed, the mix of drama and comedy are expertly interwoven, and I'm genuinely excited for season 2 even though, given Amazon's track record, that'll probably be sometime in 2027. The characters on the whole are also great. The ghoul is good. He's a badass, acted expertly by Walton Goggins, and he operates in a moral gray area that I might describe as off-black. It makes sense, given he was around when the world was still intact, and has been scrambling to survive for over two centuries. We've seen people do some dark stuff with only an average lifespan, so it makes a lot of sense for him to be this ice-cold killer. Maximus, played by Aaron Clifton Moten, is pretty solid. I might say that he's a little under-reactive at times, but he still works really well for me. There are times that you can really see that, deep down, he's still that child who got saved by a big army man. That also plays into his emotional depth. If he has big feelings, it's hard for him to hide them, and he doesn't really know how to handle social situations. There's some subtlety to it that warrants some appreciation. Third and final of the main cast is Lucy, played by Ella Purnell. She definitely has the biggest character arc out of the three protagonists. Seeing her start off as this Billy Batson, American sweat of the brow type, born in a meritocracy, and slowly, slowly becoming another wastelander is at times hilarious and other times utterly devastating. Even then, it isn't a total descent into being a monster. Even her last words are... Okie dokie. So she's still in there. I'd say just notably starting to take the darker path that she needs to in order to continue surviving. The supporting cast all play their roles very well. I love Norm. Evening, everybody. Norm! Sammy, set me up. <laughs> and Hank, Thaddeus, and Moldaver and they all feel like natural extensions of the narrative. So, final thoughts? Bethesda has problems. Lots of problems. I could sit here and play armchair critic to them for another couple hours, but that's not the YouTuber I wanna be. But when it comes to this show, aside from a few teensy tiny things, I'm undeniably impressed. I do genuinely believe that even if you haven't touched a game before, you'll still get a kick out of the show. 
My personal feelings are muddled. Born from a lifelong experience with a franchise that has swapped from sweet to sour depending on the year, and a critical eye that has been poked a few times by Vault Boy's thumb, Bethesda, as a game studio, still doesn't have my trust. Not a single iota of it. That bridge has been burned, and I see they keep setting up a new one made from rope, but Todd Howard standing on the other end with a serrated blade and a shit-eating grin. But looking at the show, I see a great piece of media made by people who want it to succeed and want it to be the best possible thing it can be. And it works, and I'm happy for that. And I'll keep watching when season two comes out. I truly believe that the show was built by people who are obsessed with the Fallout universe, like I was with the franchise, like I was with Doctor Who, like I am with DC Comics. Bethesda, after all my time dedicated to their games, can go hang. But this, this is something special. The bar may have been low for video game adaptations until fairly recently, but it just got raised a hell of a lot higher. If you really enjoyed the video, hopefully enough to have left a like and subscribed, you'll be happy to know that I also have a video available here on 100 other shows and movies I recommend you check out. Thanks for sticking with us. I'll see you in the next one.